Welcome to Audit the Audit, where we sort out the who and what and the right and wrong of police interactions. This episode covers court cases, search warrants, and obstruction, and is brought to us by AL.com's channel. Be sure to check out the description below and give them the credit that they deserve. Before we dive into the episode, I want to invite you to check out the new Audit the Audit merchandise shelf just below this video. I strive to create merch that is more than just a billboard for this channel, and I personally design the graphics for all ATA products. Merch is a great way to show your support for this channel, and to show my support for this audience, I will be giving away three Audit the Audit shirts to randomly selected viewers who subscribe to this channel and leave a comment on this video. The raffle will end one week from this video being posted, so be sure to hit the subscribe button before it's too late. Now let's dive right in and audit the interaction. On February 23rd, 2017, attorneys Victor Revel and Megan Garcia were leaving the courthouse with their client, Lloyd Edwards. After appearing in court in reference to a protection from abuse order initiated by Mr. Edwards's wife, Jasmine. Before leaving the courthouse, Mr. Edwards gave two of his three cell phones to Mr. Rebel. As Ms. Garcia, Mr. Rebel, and Mr. Edwards exited the courthouse, they were confronted by Deputy Ashworth and Deputy Ratliff of the Blunt County Sheriff's Office in Blunt County, Alabama, who were attempting to serve a search warrant of Mr. Edwards and his vehicle. Uh, I'm from the Sheriff's Office. Do you have any other weapons on your person at this time that I need to know about? No, sir. No, I'm in the car. Okay. What do you have in normal with? A small pistol. Okay. Your vehicle is also part of this search. Okay. So I'm going to have to ask you, do you have the keys to your automobile? Yes, sir. I need the keys to your automobile right now. Okay. Let me pat you down, make sure you don't have any other weapon. Just for your safety and ours. As mentioned earlier in the video, Mr. Edwards was appearing in court about a protection order issued by his wife. Mrs. Edwards alleged that Mr. Edwards had abused her and their daughter, and testified that Mr. Edwards' cell phones contained proof of her claims. Mrs. Edwards' testimony led the prosecution to pursue a search warrant for Mr. Edwards' person and vehicle, specifically targeting his three cell phones. I called the Revel Law Firm, and Mr. Revel stated that there was no evidence of abuse on the phones, and that the phones actually contained evidence that supported Mr. Edwards' innocence. Mr. Revel claims that Mrs. Edwards had exchanged explicit messages with Mr. Edwards, which indicated that her interactions with him were consensual and that he intended to submit the phones as evidence for the defense. Mr. Edwards later stated that Mr. Revel told him that, quote, there may come a day when the prosecution wants your phone. And one of the attorneys asked him for the two phones just before exiting the courtroom. The phones were then placed into Mrs. Garcia's briefcase prior to exiting the building. Uh, you, the warrants that you all have are for his person That's and, right. for, and for his vehicle. That's correct. So he has given the phone that's on his person. Okay, I have video of him handing the phone to you. You hand the phone to her. It's okay. in the satchel right now. No, you all do have that, but that is not on. When you all no, I'm not here for house with Brian on the search That was not on his person. Okay. So you all are not entitled to that. Okay. Well, all right then. We'll go the other route to get that other phone. As Mr. Revel mentioned, the language of the search warrant dictates that the search may be performed on Mr. Edwards' immediate person and vehicle only. Since Mr. Edwards was not in possession of the phones at the time of the warrant being served, the deputies are not entitled to them. If the deputies had acquired a search warrant for the phones themselves, then they may have had some authority to seize them. But the validity of such a search warrant would be questionable, considering that the defense also intends to submit the phones as evidence. The search warrant presented by the officers does not authorize them to search Mrs. Garcia, but the prosecution does have a trick up its sleeve, which we will discuss later in the video. After realizing that Mr. Revel is refusing to comply with the search, Deputy Ashworth calls the district attorney's office for advice on how to proceed. Okay. Right, we're standing here and we, we have it on video that he handed his um, cell phone to his attorney, uh, one, and they handed it to another, and it's in the satchel that is right here. Well, are we being detained at this moment in time? They're not denying it. We have I'm it on going video. To detain you until we determine the next course of action. Give me well, just a minute. Well, I have this okay. person and vehicle. I'm going to turn this off. I don't think what we've just done. Send that 
sure. Okay. Um, okay. We either need the phone out of the satchel or we will have to detain you and get a search warrant to get the phone. So you're going to, well, okay. Uh, well, we're not going to give you his, we're not going to give you anything that's on our person that you don't have a, a, a right to. So if you detain us, you know, you got there's, you have, you have to have, you know, certain, there's certain constitutional safeguards to do that. But if you're going to detain us, then hey, we're not going to run. So, are you, are, and you all are telling us we are being detained. Is that right, Officer um, Rapp? Right right now, you are being detained. Okay. You both are under arrest for obstructing government operations. Obstructing government operations. That's correct. This is definitely an unlawful arrest, but we're under arrest, we're under arrest. Mr. Revel is more than correct that this arrest is unlawful. Not only are the deputies charging Mr. Revel under the authority of an irrelevant search warrant, but neither Mr. Revel or Mrs. Garcia did anything that would constitute a violation of Alabama Code 13A-10-2. The code states that a person commits the crime of obstructing governmental operations if, by means of intimidation, physical force, or interference, intentionally obstructs the administration of law or prevents a public service from performing a governmental function. Neither Mr. Revel nor Mrs. Garcia conducted themselves in a manner that was intimidating, physically forceful, or interfering. They both simply stated that they would not comply with the deputies' unlawful orders. They did nothing to prevent the deputies from seizing the phone. If the deputies were so sure that the search warrant authorized them to seize the phones, then what was stopping them from taking Mrs. Garcia's bag and getting them? Certainly not Mr. Revel or Mrs. Garcia. Sir, if you would um, around, let me make sure you don't have no weapon on you. Of course not. Okay. Let me make sure. We have it on video. We have not. We have not broken the law. So if you're arresting us. I'm being arrested for obstructing government operations. That's correct. Let me take off this, this right here. Uh, if you don't mind, take them properly. That way it'll be a lot. Really? I don't care. Yeah, you all want to arrest two lawyers? For this car? You sure you want to do this? Are you supposed to take a lot? I am supposed to take a lot. Okay. Right here. Okay. 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 And this is... And you... And what's... Who are you? I'm Sue Ashworth. Thank you. Sue Ashworth? That's correct. And this is Brian Ratliff. And you're, and you're arresting us under her orders? Yes, sir. Okay. Deputy Randall, yes, sir. I, want to, I want to make sure that you know from our position, our position was that this search warrant, this, uh, this warrant was given to him after he, he gave us some, some things for us to use in his defense. And so we did not do anything to keep you all from doing you all's job. Now, if you all want to I'm take out of here this with, satchel uh, and go the through and do it, at the we can't, we're not, we're not, we're not we're preventing you from doing the going. search warrant on the car. Uh, so I just to I'm out of here just... From the moment he's entered the courthouse, he's been under surveillance. Yes, okay. For the reasons of this search warrant. All right. I'm sitting here and watch you and him and her. I can't believe we're getting about 10 or 15 minutes. I'll be ready. You looked up. You, as a matter of fact, you did look up at the camera two or three times. He pulled the phone out and handed it to you. You handed it back to him. He was fooling with, I'm guessing, a password. Hey, and after a short period of time, he handed it back to you. You handed it to her. She put it in here. Okay? That is evidence for this search warrant. And, and you agree with me that you all served this search warrant help? subsequent to that, after that, right? Yeah. After we left out the field. Yes. Yeah. The deputies fail to understand the authoritative limitations of the search warrant, and Mr. Revel and Mrs. Garcia were arrested and charged under Code 13A-10-2. The prosecution initially offered to drop the charges if Mr. Revel agreed to write a letter apologizing and admitting that the deputies did nothing wrong, but Mr. Revel rejected their offer and decided to proceed with a trial. In the ensuing criminal trial, Mr. Revel and Mrs. Garcia's defense argued that the state failed to establish the defendant's intent, and 
and that no crime was committed because the search warrant did not authorize the search of Mr. Edwards' attorneys. The prosecution argued that they were entitled to the phones under the exigent circumstances doctrine, which is a legal precedent that allows for warrantless searches in circumstances where evidence has a high likelihood of being destroyed, such as cell phone data. I have covered the exigent circumstances doctrine in a previous video, which I will link in the info card above. During the trial, Mr. Edwards, who was still under investigation at the time, testified for the prosecution, but stated that District Attorney Casey tried to prep him in his testimony, even though she had reportedly recused herself from the case, and Mr. Edwards became a key witness for Mr. Revel's defense. Ultimately, Judge King acquitted Mr. Revel and Mrs. Garcia of all charges and stated that the deputies were wrong about the authority of the search warrant and that the defendants never physically prevented the deputies from carrying out their duties. Mr. Revel and Mrs. Garcia were forced to recuse themselves from Mr. Edwards' case after filing two separate federal lawsuits against Deputy Ratliff and Deputy Ashworth, as well as District Attorney Casey and the Assistant District Attorney Scott Gilliland. It is worth noting that Mr. Edwards has yet to go to trial, and his case has been reset by a different grand jury several times over the past two years. It is highly irregular for a district attorney to delay indictment when the suspect has been charged, and there is merit to the notion that she may be delaying Mr. Edwards' prosecution so that she can use his pending case as leverage against him for his testimony in the federal lawsuit against her. Nonetheless, Mr. Revel is optimistic about the case and told me that he expects to reach a settlement agreement with certain undisclosed stipulations. Overall, the deputies and district attorneys of the Blunt County Sheriff's Office get an F for exaggerating the authority of a search warrant, violating Mr. Revel and Mrs. Garcia's Fourth Amendment rights, and falsely arresting them for obstruction. At one point in the video, Deputy Ashworth states that she is detaining Mr. Revel and Mrs. Garcia until she is able to acquire a search warrant, and she may have had the authority to do that under the exigent circumstance doctrine. If Deputy Ashworth had stuck to that plan, she may have been able to legally seize the phones, but she instead chose to escalate the detainment to an arrest, rather than waiting for for a proper search warrant. The phones were eventually searched by the prosecution, but they did not contain any usable evidence. And even if they had, the prosecution would not have been able to submit them as evidence in the trial against Mr. Edwards because the phones were illegally obtained. The only thing that the prosecution got out of this interaction was a federal lawsuit that will likely result in a hefty settlement. Mr. Revel gets an A plus for having the mental agility and conversational fortitude to dispute the validity of the search warrant and the courage Courage and conviction to defend his personal liberty and stand by his defendant's rights. Mr. Revel immediately knew that the arrest was unlawful and offered the deputies multiple opportunities to reconsider. There is no doubt that Mr. Revel and Mrs. Garcia will walk away from this case with a victory, and any client would be lucky to have their representation. Mr. Revel deserves recognition for his conduct during this interaction, and I will leave a link to the Revel Law Firm's website in the description below for anyone in Alabama who may be interested in seeking their services. Let us know if there is an interaction or legal topic you would like us to cover in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe for more police interaction content.